Hi, my name's Leo and I'm a Sterling Engine addict. Hi, Leo. This is now episode three in my Sterling Engine saga. If you click up there somewhere or look in the description below, you'll find links to the other two episodes. I've now completed my dynamometer. I'm ready to run some real engine tests and get some real data. So let's get started. Building this dynamometer was, as usual, a lot more painful than I had anticipated. The mechanical parts and the electrical parts came together pretty well because I'm good at that stuff. I had chosen LabVIEW as the software platform to control it, and that turned out to be a two-week brain-melting time suck that I still haven't emotionally recovered from. I swear I could have coded this thing in assembly language faster. But LabVIEW has some pretty tantalizingly cool features that just kept me from giving up, even though I wanted to so bad. Even now that it's all working, if I look at the code, I get this really uneasy feeling because I realize I barely understand how this thing works. It just feels like a big squirming pile of spaghetti that somehow started to do what I wanted to do. So I just poked at it until it worked and then tried to edge away without getting any sauce on my face. In the last video, I went into pretty gory detail explaining how this dynamometer works, but it's basically an eddy current brake attached to a torque transducer that moves under computer control. The power is dissipated in the flywheel, which is a piece of aluminum. Before trying to run this dynamometer with my Stirling engine, I wanted to test it out thoroughly. So I got an old Bosch drill that I had with a half busted gearbox and set it up as a test engine. I'm able to get some really nice performance curves out of it that show the speed, torque and power very clearly. This gives me the confidence that now it's ready to really do some serious testing with my Stirling engine. The last time we ran this Stirling engine, the displacer regenerator overheated and died. So I really had no choice but to design and fabricate a new one. This part performs a super critical function in the engine. You could really say it's the heart of the engine. It's also one of the most difficult pieces to design and fabricate. It's got to be super lightweight. It's got to be relatively precision. It's got to withstand high temperatures. And it also has to allow me to try various materials inside quickly and easily. So I really had to be clever. I made the outer skin of this part by laminating two sheets of beer can aluminum with some high temperature silicone. The hubs are made out of some two millimeter aluminum that I cut out with a coping saw by hand. The whole thing gets glued together with a delicate amount of high temperature red silicone glue. I also glued the set screws because I find that they can still rotate enough to come loose but they can't rattle and fall out when you're playing with it, which is very important with a fiddly thing like this. I then had to develop some little system to hold the regenerator material in while the engine is violently shaking it up and down. These little clips go all the way through the whole assembly and hold everything in place. The little clips on the bottom prevent it all from coming apart, yet they're easy to remove so you can switch the materials. I carefully packed the regenerator filled with steel wool to get it back to the same configuration as the original tests. I start the cooling water. Okay, cooling water, check. Let's get this proper started.
guess that's the end of the show. Wow, that, that was kind of a wild ride there. You can kind of see, hiding under all the craziness, the basic shape of the power curve. But what is this big spike here at the beginning? I've seen this behavior before. Whenever I try a new steel wool regenerator in my engine, there's always this burst of performance at the beginning before the stuff becomes oxidized and matted down. But it makes me realize that there's maybe some unutilized potential here if I can find the right combination of materials and configuration that can extract this little magic bit of performance. Either that or the steel wool is just burning and it's becoming an internal combustion engine for a couple seconds before it burns out. Lots to learn here. I also noticed there's a little glitch in the tachometer data. I think that's just because my setup is not very rigid and things are vibrating too much. For the next test, I wanted to try some stainless steel pot scrubber material. This stuff is good because it's much heavier and it doesn't burn or oxidize like the steel wool does. But you can see it makes the engine much more docile and sluggish. It's more like a tugboat engine than a two-stroke motorcycle engine, for example. You can really feel that the engine performs more calm and smooth, but delivers far less performance than the steel wool potentially could. Now we have a much cleaner output graph without all this peaky crazy stuff going on. The only thing weird is right at the end where the engine stalls and the tachometer signal gets tricked into thinking that the frequency has risen because the engine kind of oscillates back and forth instead of turning. If we open up the cylinder head and look at the regenerator, we can see it's in really good shape. It's barely oxidized and looks like it could run like this all day long. Very nice, except it's kind of boring. Especially when you consider that the peak power output is a pavement scorching two watts delivered at 500 stump pulling grand centimeters of torque. Yawn. Looking at all these curves produced by the dynamometer, it's clear that there's some very good information hidden within these curves but it's a bit like reading tea leaves to try to understand what it all means. Looking at one of the best runs here, you can kind of see at the end where it goes into a constant torque mode. This makes sense if you think about the fact that the eddy current brake is always putting a load that's proportional to speed. So if the gap of the magnet starts to close and the engine can only put out a fixed torque, the RPM has to drop as the magnetic gap closes. So that the amount of torque produced will be constant, but the speed at which it does so it drops lower and lower and the power declines as such. A constant torque implies a constant cylinder pressure. So at this point, it looks like we're thermodynamically saturated and can't get any more pressure out. But what we could do is get more actual mechanical power out of that pressure. Our engine uses a diaphragm rather than a piston, and diaphragms are not known for their efficiency in converting pressure into mechanical force, especially when they're stretched to quite a degree like ours is. That and the fact that the diaphragm seems to last only 10 or 15 minutes before it rips is a very compelling reason to redesign this around a piston configuration. Changing to a piston design requires elongating the cylinder, and that requires a complete redesign of the entire engine case, which I'm going to have to do anyway to solve a number of very significant problems. 
Number one is I need to solve the engine balance problem. I need to add counterweights to the crankshafts. And I also need to beef up the engine mount and casing to suppress residual vibrations, making it a wonky mess like it is now. Number two, I have to beef up the size of the main shafts and bearings that support the gears. The little five millimeter shafts are too wimpy and I found that at high RPM, these shafts were deflecting enough to allow the displacer yoke and the piston yoke to crash into each other while the displacer was reversing direction. This caused a really annoying clacking sound that I actually had to solve by putting a little rubber bumper in between the two parts. Sketchy, but at least it allowed me to keep going. So after completing what is arguably a pretty wonky bit of testing, I come to the sort of existential crisis part of the project. When I realize how much more work I have to do, I clearly need to have a much more controlled heat source than just waving a crazy propane torch around. My engine is horribly out of balance and jiggles like crazy. The diaphragm tears quickly after 10, 15 minutes of running and also puts out a feeble, pathetic amount of power. So it's really kind of a deep frustration that I'm left with. But it's also tantalizing because I think, wow, I could fix all these little problems and can keep going. And that's what I'm going to do. But I have to get calm and collected to feel like it's all going to be worth it. But the worth it is a completely existential idea. There, there really is no goal. Like Sterling engines are not going to save the world, but it, you can certainly have a great time playing with them. So that's where, where I have to leave this. So thanks again for watching this crazy saga. I hope you enjoyed yourself and learned something. Please support me in my efforts. Click uh, like, subscribe to my channel, make lots of comments, feed the algorithm what it wants to push me up and make this grow. Thank you all very, very much.